Okay, so thank you for showing up this evening. This is um, the uh, Exploring Ethics Forum that we've been conducting now since May of last year at the Fleet Science Center. I'm Mike Kalichman, co-director for the Center for Ethics in Science and Technology. Our program tonight, as I, I presume all of you know, is about who owns your genes regarding the patenting of human genes. And we are going to be um, uh, experiencing three different speakers who have some outstanding perspectives on the topic this evening. Uh, before I start, I wanted to just get a quick um, logistic count for us, though, about how people ended up here today. So many of you are here because you've been to previous Ethics Center events. Okay, that's quite a few people. How many of you are here? Two things that I'll refer to at the end of the program are that um, on that blue table by the door down there, there are two small pieces of paper. One in yellow is an evaluation form for this evening's program. The other in white is a mailing list. So if you aren't on our mailing list and would like to be so we can let you know about future programs, please check that out. And the evaluation form is very helpful for us to understand what works and what doesn't work with what we're doing so we can continue to try and provide these programs as a venue for discussion about um, some of the controversial areas of science and technology. I want to, uh, as quickly as possible now, get into our program with our speakers. They have all agreed to help us keep on time this evening, so we'll aim for about 30 to 35 minutes from now. They should be done giving you some background, and then you'll have a chance to be part of a conversation in which you can ask questions and join us in discussion about the um, issues that we're talking about tonight. Our first speaker is Len Deftos from UC San Diego. Len also um, decided to get some training in law in addition to being an MD. And related to that, he's been interested for a number of years in the question of patenting of life and genes. And that background is very important to understand how we got to where we are today. So Len is going to start the program off and give us a, sort of a 101 on patenting of those kinds of things. So Len Deftos. Almost everybody in this room has probably given a blood sample, right? So if you give a blood sample, say, at a medical institution, and the person collecting that blood sample creates an invention and makes a lot of money, do you have any right to that money? How many of you think you do? OK. What if you, uh, how many of you had, have uh, had biopsies done? Okay. If you want that tissue back, can you get it back? No. No. What if you're a sperm donor? And uh, that leads to a conception that you can trace. Do you have any rights to that person? Oh. Well, these are not simple questions, but in general, well, we'll come back to the answers. What if your family has an inherited disease and you and your family contribute money, blood samples, tissue samples to the development of a gene test for that disease? Do you and or your family members have any rights to have those gene tests performed for free? How many of you think you do? How many of you think you should? Big difference, right? Yeah. And that's the type of issue that we'll be facing today. The answer to almost all of those questions is no. You have no rights. So there are really parts of your body, when they leave your body, usually voluntarily, uh, that you lose rights to. You don't have any ownership rights to your body. That's not an ethical issue. That's a legal issue. That's the way our laws are written, and that's the way Supreme Court, mostly Supreme Court, or, or major court decisions have been made. And all of those examples that I gave you actually do represent cases uh, in which the person was found to have no property rights 
to that part of their body that they gave up or was taken from them. But should we? And I think that that's the question we're going to try to talk to today. So what should be and what is and how can we get to what should be? And we're going to focus, at least I'm going to focus today, on uh, patent law because that's what regulates much of these property issues uh, that we have in front of us. Uh, where does patent law come from? It's been around for centuries, centuries. European countries well before the United States was even envisioned. Uh, our patent law comes from British law, as much of our law comes from, from something called the Statute of Monopolies. Now, you may not think of patents as monopolies, but that's, in fact, their legal impact. They give you, as the patent owner, a monopoly to practice the art, the invention that derives, uh, that, that is guided by that patent. Patents are considered in a policy level as a social contract between the government who gives patents and individuals or companies who receive patents and the contract's goals are to promote invention to give the inventor something that will promote his or her invention, but to make public disclosure of that invention. One of the differences in patent, one of the differences in intellectual property law, which is what we're talking about, are trade secrets. You may hear of trade secrets. In that case, the, the, the secret is in fact protected, but there is no obligation, in fact, you can tell by the name, for the owner of that secret or the creator to give it up in any way. But, he, but the protections are not as great as they are. Patent law is embedded in our Constitution. Its authorship has been attributed to Thomas Jefferson, in fact. <clears throat> and in brief, it says um, that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science. Now, the wording has changed a little bit. Science actually meant copyright early. And useful arts, that's what patents were called, and that's a term that sticks around, uh, by securing for limited times, limited times, currently 20 years, used to be 17, 20 years from the issuance, uh, the time of application, it used to be 17 years from the issuance, for, for limited times to authors and inventors, author being copyright and inventors, the ex exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So just a few words, paragraphs in the Constitution has created a body of law that is so extensive that it's mind-boggling because each of these phrases has to be interpreted. What can we patent or what can be patentable? There are some criteria, uh, a process, which is really an art, was called an art until 1952, and there's something called a product of a process claim, a little too complicated for us. A machine, uh, one of the most famous laws, uh, one of the most famous cases in patent laws was about a machine made by Deere Manufacturing and how a certain part of it worked, uh, and that uh, has had a profound influence on uh, some of the criteria for patent law. A composition of matter, two or more chemicals. And that's where genes fall in, compositions of matter. Um, manufacture a product or a composition of matter often regulates life patents. Now, in the United States, living things can be patented. Animals in whom a specific gene that is not found in nature, or at least that version isn't found in nature, has been inserted can be patented. Uh, by contrast, in some European countries and in Canada, that is not permissible patent material. So there are differences in countries. Famously, in the case that opened up patent law, it was about bacteria, actually, but it led to the sort of proclamation by the Supreme Court that anything under the sun made by man and that's very important, made by man is, in fact, patentable. 
There are some things that aren't patentable. Atomic weapons, interestingly, are not patentable for security reasons or any of the things that go into making atomic weapons. Laws of nature um, are not patentable. A physical phenomenon like a new but a wild plant is not patentable. Uh, plant plant patents have profoundly influenced our patent law. Now, abstract ideas are not patentable like gravity. However, Business plans, business plans are currently patentable. Now there's a case coming up before the Supreme Court, in fact, that's going to readdress that issue. It's caused a lot of consternation uh, because a plan sounds like an idea so much. And if it's, if it's connected to a machine, maybe it will be patentable. What is necessary for something to be patentable? Well, it has to be patentable subject matter, as we just discussed, like chemicals and genes. Uh, it has to have value, real-world value, and that's very, very important for biopatents, especially as I think some of the other speakers will address, especially for patenting genes. It has to have value, and not vague value. It used to be any credible utility. That was the phrase early in development of gene patents. Any credible utility, which just left the door wide open. Now it has to be substantial utility. Um, novelty. Um, now we can debate whether in today, at today, whether the processes and the science that is involved in developing a test is no longer novel. It's so well known, maybe it shouldn't those types of tests shouldn't be allowed. And that's one potential chink in this armor of the patent law. And there's something called non-obvious that uh, even confuses me. Um, but I, I don't think I can say any much more about it that will enlighten you, but something that's not obvious. What about gene patents? <clears throat> gene patents are allowed in most countries. There are some countries that essentially, usually third world countries, that essentially don't allow or recognize any patents that are related to living matter in any way. They don't recognize gene patents, they don't recognize transgenic animal patents, but that's in the minority. Are, gene pa are genes chemical compounds? Yes, that's what they are. Now when you take that information out of our body, just like blood cells and tissue cells and sperm and eggs, when you take it out of our body, it becomes a chemical. In fact, some representation of that gene in developing a test is DNA not found in nature. It's called cDNA. It's, it's, an, it's a totally invented artificial form of DNA, and it, it is not, there is no comparable part of it in nature, and it's an important, important in all of these processes. Are they useful? Yes, very useful for genetic tests. Are they non-obvious? Generally, yes, but I mentioned a little while ago why that may be changing. And can a naturally occurring substance be novel? Can it be novel, a naturally occurring substance? So a chemical is not novel if it is present in nature, in nature. But purified preparations of naturally occurring biological products meet the novelty requirement of patent law. Genes are patentable when isolated from their impure form, that's how they are in our body, when a gene, which is relatively small, uh, is fused with another, uh, with our genome, which is in fact uh, huge. If we don't like this, if we want to go from where we are to where we should be, as I think most of you indicated uh, very early, uh, how can we do it? Well, we can challenge gene patents. We can challenge patent law, and we can, and that's what in fact the ACLU is, uh, ACLU is doing, and you'll hear uh, Kevin tell you a little bit about that law. Uh, the ACLU in this case has a novel approach to patent law. Rather than challenging patent law, they're challenging the constitutional basis of patent law, uh, among other things. There can be new legislation. There was legislation several years ago that just said you can't patent genes. It passed the House 
but never made it out of committee, never got to the Senate, never went anywhere. In Europe, there's something called a morality or ethics clause for all patents. If something is considered not good for the public order, very vague, but probably good to be vague, uh, that patent can be either prohibited or once it's allowed, it can be challenged. <clears throat> In European patent law, which is very important obviously, it is very easy to challenge a patent either before it's been awarded or within a short period of time after its award. It's a relatively easy process. In the United States, it's a very difficult process because a patent that is allowed, that is awarded, is presumed to be valid. So the person that challenges it has this hurdle to, crime, uh, to climb. They have to prove uh, that it's not patentable, and they have to do it by a reasonably high legal standard that's called clear and convincing evidence, which is not quite uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, another standard in the law, but higher than 50-50 which is the usual standard in the law and which is in fact the standard for proving something to a patent, uh, to the patent office, just 50-50 or 51-50, I should, 51-49. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, some countries do not allow or recognize uh, patents. In fact, they call the process biopiracy. <clears throat> Has anybody taken the position that patents are unethical? Yes, some individuals have. One of the most profound examples of that are Kohler and Milstein. Does anybody know who Kohler and Milstein are? Does anybody know what antibodies are? Does anybody know what monoclonal antibodies are? Okay, so antibodies are something that we make in our body to fight disease. They have a lot of other uses. Monoclonal antibodies are made outside of our body. They're made in a dish. And that procedure was developed by Kohler and Milstein many, many years ago. They did not want to patent it. The institution where they were uh, wanted them to patent it. It could have been a huge moneymaker. Monoclonal antibodies are one of the biggest products in all of biology. And they took the position that patenting is unethical. Uh, Jonas Salk, early in his career, asked prophetically, can you patent the sun? Well, you can't, but you can patent anything under the sun made by man. Um, there are some companies, Merck among them, that have decided to make all of their proprietary data that has to do with genetics um, public. So once that information is public, it is no longer patentable. You can't I use it to make a patent. And there are, in fact, consortiums of scientists who have created websites where they post genetic information and other information in order to not allow it to be patented. So there's movement in that area. There was even a company called Bounty Quest. I think, unfortunately, it went out of business. But its business plan was, if you want to challenge a patent, um, you post that on their website and invite individuals to find what's called prior art. That is to find a publication or some disclosure somewhere that proves that that patent is either non-obvious or not novel. Um, and they did have some big hits early in, the big, early in, their, uh, in their life, but I think, as I said, they've gone out of business. It wasn't a good business plan. Who holds patents? This is, uh, these are I think 2000 data, the year 2000 data about who holds patents uh, in the United, is this the United States or the world? I think this is, well, one of the two places, it doesn't matter, but look who's near the top of the list, University of California, one of the biggest patent holders. But the truth of the matter is that of the probably thousands of patents that the University of California owns, a very small 
minority of them have been money makers, have provided royalty to the university. Most of them never do, including the one patent that I hold. <laughs> so um, that's, I hope, an introduction to our topic. A and I think we're going to find out what do the panelists think, but I already know what you think about whether genes should be patented. And I hope I've given you some insight as to the means that which we can make our views felt and manifest at a public policy level to change the things from what they are to what they should be.